A two-dimensional high-density apple training system, often referred to as a fruiting wall, provides many benefits to the fruit grower. In this video, we will discuss how to construct a durable trellis that will hold up to the stress of windy weather and heavy crop loads. The tall spindle is one of the more common trellis systems, as it encourages fruit production in the second to third year after planting, and the increased light interception within the canopy allows for high quality fruit production throughout the tree. Because this training system relies on trees on precocious, dwarfing rootstocks, it is imperative that a support system be installed soon after planting the trees. The success of your trellis will depend on your specific orchard site and system. Variables to consider include your soil types, clay soils and dry soils resist failure better than sandy or wet soils, anticipated wind forces the trellis will need to withstand, and your canopy type. In this example, a tall spindle fruiting wall. These variables will determine which construction materials you will need, how to properly space and set your posts, and the spacing of your inline posts. There are interactive tools you can use to determine how the unique variables of your site will impact your construction. One such tool can be found at trellax.com. This website was developed through collaborative research between Washington State University, Decline Machine Company, and Steep Consulting, and can be downloaded as a free spreadsheet. Though specific site factors will impact your construction, there are a few key engineering principles to use as a guideline. Pressure treated wooden posts should be used for end posts and inline posts, and are also the strongest choice for tieback posts. End posts should be driven four feet into the ground using hydraulic or vibrating post driver. End posts should be five to six inches in diameter, and post length will be determined by the desired height of the tree. Inline posts should be 4 to 5 inches in diameter. A 5 inch post is 50% stronger than a 4 inch post. These posts should be driven 3 to 4 feet deep and spaced to a maximum of 30 feet apart. The number of inline posts you need per row will depend on the length of your row and on your topography. A rolling site will require more posts. Tieback posts should be 5 to 6 inches in diameter, driven 4 feet into the ground, and angled away from the direction of the pull of the wire. Wooden tieback posts prevent trellis failure better than screw and anchors. If anchors are to be used, they should be at least 5 feet long and have at least a 6 inch wide plate. High tensile, class 3, 12.5 gauge, galvanized steel wire should be used. The wire should be spaced between 2 and 2.5 two and feet along the height of the trellis to have many places to secure the leader to the wire as it grows. Keeping the leader securely tied will keep the leader growing upright, preserving its apical dominance. Wires will be tensioned to 200 to 250 pounds. Do not over tension as this will prematurely weaken the strength of the wires. Trellis rows should be no longer than 500 feet. If you are planting in an area where tree rows will be longer than this, you will need to split up the rows into separate 500 foot sections. In addition to strengthening your trellis, keeping rows shorter will make it easier for crews to move throughout your orchard block. There are two options for securing wires to the posts. The first is to use a hand drill to run the wires through each post. Holes will be drilled parallel to the row for inline and end posts and perpendicular through tieback posts. Alternatively, the wire can be attached to the post using 2 inch, 9 gauge, double barbed, class 3 galvanized staples. Staples should have slash cut points as these will help prevent the staple from dislodging from the post. Tieback and end posts will be double stapled to help keep the wires in place. For inline posts, Two staples should be driven approximately an inch apart at a 45 degree angle, forming a V on the post that the wire will be placed through. Angle the staples so they do not run with the grain of the wood. This will help keep them from coming out of the posts. Now, let's go through the steps of constructing the trellis. Using the principles we just discussed, we will construct a four wire trellis with wires at 2.5, 5.5, 7.5, and 9.5 feet above the ground. Having the top wire at 9.5 feet will allow us to grow trees to a mature height of about 10 feet. All posts will be set 4 feet deep using a hydraulic post driver. We will be using pressure treated wood for all of our posts, including the tie back posts. For each row in this trellis, we will use end posts that are 6 inches in diameter and 14 feet long. Each row will need two tie back posts 6 inches in diameter and 8 feet in length. Our inline posts are 5 inches in diameter and 14 feet long. Inline posts will be placed 30 feet apart in the rows. We will be using the high tensile wire we previously described. 
We will also use a spinning jenny wire derailleur for laying out the wire. This will help reduce the risk of recoil or kinks developing within the wire, which will greatly weaken the strength of the trellis. In this example, we will drill holes through our posts for passing the wires, though we will discuss stapling as well. On one end of the trellis, wires will be wrapped around the tieback post, which we'll refer to as tieback post A, using either two crimp sleeves or a gripple. Three crimp sleeves can also be used to join wire rolls together. Gripples can be retightened, making them a good choice, but there are many other fasteners and tightening tools available. At the other end of the trellis, at tieback post B, we will need inline wire strainers and two crimp sleeves for looping off the wire. You will need a gripple and or crimp tool and a wire strainer tensioner. Trees will be attached to the wire using U-clips. You can use any other material that will keep the tree attached to the wire that allows room for trunk growth to prevent girdling. Again, your materials and design may differ depending on your specific orchard conditions and what materials you have access to. Before constructing your trellis, be sure to take any necessary safety precautions. High tensile wire can easily recoil, so it is important to wear gloves and eye protection when stringing your wires. Wear tightly woven fabrics, long pants, and sturdy boots. Ear protection and a hard hat is also suggested when setting the posts. It is imperative that the leader of the tree remain straight and secured from wind forces, so you will want to have your supplies well before planting time. Construct your trellis shortly after planting to protect your young trees once they are in the ground. Research shows the importance of keeping the leader tight as it grows. Trees with weak growing leaders may also require a temporary, inexpensive support in between wires. You can also set your post before planting your trees and then string a wire once they are planted. Stringing a single wire as soon as possible can buy some time, and you can also consider individual temporary stakes for your trees if trellis construction is going to be delayed. To construct your trellis, start by laying out the trellis rows. Mark out the corners of the new planting site with stakes. Using these as a reference, lay out a straight line between the corners and mark the sites of each trellis row with lime or spray paint. These will be where you place each tieback post. Having marked the location of the tieback post, posts should be angled about 10 degrees opposite the direction of the wires and driven into the ground using a post driver. Driven posts will have the best contact with undisturbed soil, making driven posts 10 times less likely to pull out of the soil than posts set in augered or dug holes. Posts should be sunk at least 4 feet into the ground. Posts may be cut closer to the ground, though keeping them longer will make them easier to see, reducing the risk of accidentally running into them with machinery. Next, mark the position of each end post in relation to the tieback post. The end post should be at least as far away from the tieback post as it is tall. The end post will be sunk 4 feet into the ground and should be angled away from the direction of the pull of the wires. When deciding how much to angle your end posts and how far to place them, consider the length of your posts, how far they must be set into the ground, and how much the angle will affect the vertical height of the post for positioning your top wire. The ideal method is to think of the wire, end post, and ground as an equilateral triangle with 60 degree angles. In this case, the distance between the tieback post and the end post will be equal to the length of the end post that is sticking out of the ground. However, if you want to get your top wire to 10 feet, this will require a 16 foot tall end post. The most important thing is to sink the end post 4 feet vertically into the ground and to not put the end post too close to the tieback. For our trellis, since our post is only 14 feet and we wanted a wire at 9.5 feet above the ground, we were only able to tip it slightly away from the direction of our wire. Once you have determined where to place and angle your end post, the smaller diameter end of the post should be driven into undisturbed soil with a hydraulic post driver. Line posts should be spaced to a maximum of 30 feet apart. The closer they are placed, the stronger the trellis will be. Pre-mark the location of each line post with a measuring line and mark it with lime or spray paint. Marking ahead will ensure posts are evenly spaced and rows are straight. Drive line posts 4 feet into the ground along the length of the line. Drive the narrower ends of the posts into the ground. Measure and mark the heights where the wires will pass through your end and inline posts. All wires will pass through the same hole on the tieback posts, which should be 4 inches above the ground. Drill the holes for your wires. Remember, holes for the tieback posts should be drilled perpendicular to the direction of your wires, while end and inline posts will be drilled parallel. Position a spinning jenny wire derailleur near tieback post A. String the wire through the drilled hole at tieback post A and fasten the loop with two crimp sleeves, a gripple, or another fastener. Starting with the bottom wire, string the wire through the end post and inline post. Once the wire has been run the full length, cut the wire at tieback post B and place the end of the wire 5 to 6 inches into the ground. This will keep the wire from springing back while you attach it to tieback post B. Alternatively, staples can be used to attach the wires. Staple the wire to the back of tieback post A, 4 inches above the ground, and once again tie off the loop with two crimp sleeves or a gripple. This should be double stapled, 
as the wire will exert a lot of force on the tieback posts. Do not drive the staples home, and leave enough space for the other three wires to fit through. If using staples, staple the wires to the windward side of each end and inline posts. Staples should be driven at 45 degree angles off a of vertical to straddle the wood grain. Staples that curve outward are much stronger than those that curve in. To ensure they curve out, rotate the staple 45 degrees off vertical away from the flat surface of the point on the upper leg of the staple. The end post will also be double stapled. As before, once the wire has been run the full length, cut the wire at tieback post B and place the end of the wire 5 to 6 inches into the ground. To attach the wires to tieback post B, cut four 3 foot lengths of wire and pass the wire through the hole of tieback post B. Place the wire through the wire strainer, loop the wire, and then tie it off using two crimp sleeves or a gripple. Alternatively, you can double staple the loop to the back of the post. Remember, do not drive staples home, as the remaining loops will also pass through it. Place the cut bottom wire you had placed in the ground into the drum of the wire strainer, and tension the wire to 200 to 250 pounds of tension using the wire tensioning tool. Be sure not to over tighten the wire. If installing in the summer, remember that the wire will contract during the winter and may need to be loosened. Starting back from tieback post A, repeat these steps to attach the remaining three wires. All wires will be attached at the same location on tieback post A and B. Attach and properly tension all wires near tieback post B. Be sure all end posts and tieback posts have been double stapled, as the wires tend to exert a lot of pressure at these points. Attach trees to the wires using the metal loops or a similar fastener that prevents tree movement while allowing room for trunk growth. Fasten the trees to the wires as the leader reaches them and attach your leader supports. Your trellis should now be complete. Planning intensive orchard systems to a trellis is a fundamental component of a successful blueprint for an orchard with the highest market quality and production efficiency. For more information on establishing and training orchards, visit the Penn State Extension Tree Fruit Production website. If growing fruit trees is a new venture for you, gather as much information as possible prior to planting an orchard, and also consider taking a Penn State Extension course on commercial fruit growing.